the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham and together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Catechism of the Catholic Church. What on earth are you thinking? Is this not clearly apostasy? This is ridiculous. This is outrageous. And, well, goodness, well, goodness, does it make any sense at all? That is what we're going to examine right now. Please stay put. We're going to go in depth. I want to call this the definitive show, the definitive examination on these particular statements. You're in for a mega treat. Get your, what do you got there? I got, I got me a nice, really good caramel coffee. Um, get a coffee, get a beer, get a Coke, Diet Coke, get whatever, a Dr. Pepper, get whatever it is that you like to drink, pull up a chair and get ready to have fun. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham and together with us, they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. What on earth is this exact statement? What on earth does it mean? What is, what, what, what is this? <laughs> A lot of controversy has really arisen from this statement and numerous other ones that we are going to examine lumen gentium uh nostra tate um and to really fully grasp what is being said here you've got to look at the context of the quote the catechism is very clear uh in terms of the context so really this is a, a gathering or or a compilation of many other documents we have here in this in this quote from the catechism and one has to fully understand those you've got to look up the actual sources and that's exactly what the catechism is pointing to in this statement about the muslims which is directly uh indeed directly from vatican II. but why did vatican II even utter something like this if it's clear that Muslims don't believe in our triune God, they deny Christ as God and Savior, they don't believe in the Incarnation, how can something like this ever be uttered by a Trinitarian faith, much less by the one true faith? How? As perplexing as it may be for you, hopefully we can unpack that today. A lot of people really do find it perplexing. The plan of salvation, really? Muslims adore God? They adore the one God? You know, a lot of people are going to stop and say, look, this to me is heresy. How can Muslims be saved by adhering to the heretical Islamic faith? A faith that denies our Holy Trinity, a faith that denies Christ as God, denies the incarnation, has a counterfeit Mary, and I can go on and on and on. But that isn't what it means. It does not say, it does not say that Muslims are worshiping God in a correct fashion. It merely says they profess, they profess. They adore the one merciful God, but they don't do so properly. And it's very clear from the documents themselves, they don't do so properly. The Muslims do not do this properly. They believe God is unipersonal. They don't believe in a trinity, so they are clearly wrong. And if we look at Lumen Gentium, <clears throat> and which we need to do to go more in depth, it is important to examine what is said there. And we're going to look at it. <clears throat> it is vitally important that we, we go and we examine what the very context is. So, when we look at Lumen Gentium 14 to 16, we've got to, in order to go more in depth on these religious groups that are being talked about, and we look at very, very clearly. The Sacred Council wishes to turn its attention firstly to the Catholic faithful. Basing itself upon sacred scripture and tradition, it teaches that the church now sojourning in earth 
as an exile is necessary for salvation. The church is necessary for salvation. This is very clearly put forth. Also, the necessity, the church is necessary for salvation. So uh, this, at times, is not realized in the documents. People look over them. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. Could not be saved. Lumen Gentium is very clear about that. This precisely eliminates any possibility that any other religion other than the Catholic faith could be the truth or be good like the Catholic Church. This is clearly laid out in the documents themselves. Very clearly laid out. The Church, that in many ways, we, we, we really need to examine more as, as, as we go forward and we read it. Because very important, uh, remember 14 to 16 are so important. It's very important that we look at them and we examine them. The church recognizes that in many ways she is linked with those who, being baptized, are honored with the name of Christian. Though they do not profess the faith in its entirety, such as evangelicals, or do not preserve unity or of communion with a successor of Peter, such as our Orthodox friends. The incredibly important thing that is noted by Lumen Gentium is that Protestants and our Eastern friends are not part of the church. It says they are linked with those who, being baptized, are honored with the name of Christian. They do not profess the fullness of truth, or as Lumen Gentium states, the faith in its entirety. Listen to the context before you say, well, William, he said they're not part of the church. Listen to everything. They don't profess the fullness of truth or the faith in its entirety, as the very document itself puts forth. We should evangelize. We should attempt to convert them because the normal way of being saved is in the one true church of Christ. And we're told in this very document, look at this. In all of Christ's disciples, the Spirit arouses the desire to be peacefully united in the manner determined by Christ as one flock under one shepherd, and he prompts them to pursue this end. Very important. But notice what we have also read. Look at what 16 says. Finally, those who have not yet received the gospel are related in various ways to the people of God. They don't have the good news. They don't have the gospel. This area talks about the Jewish people in the first place as related in various ways to the people of God. This language is incredibly reminiscent of the text that we'll later look at in St. Justin the Martyr in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew. So we have proceedings for looking at Scripture, early church fathers, and great saints of our faith, great monks and great writers that will echo the very same thing. Very same thing. So it's important. But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. Here is something incredibly important. Lumen Gentium is not declaring that everyone is saved. This is not the message of the text. Rather, it is how these groups are related to the church. Over and over, Lumen Gentium notes that the church is absolutely necessary for one to be saved. It is essentially necessary. Lumen Gentium is very clear that despite professing the hold of faith of Abraham, they do so in a distorted fashion. They do not profess the truth. We'll get back to that in a bit, because a little while ago, we talked about how this is dealt with in Justin, St. Justin the Martyr. But what about Scripture? What does that talk about in terms of worshiping God? Is there anything there? And there is indeed. Acts 17. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through 
and considering the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God. So they were worshiping a fake deity, a pagan deity. They weren't worshiping the one true God, were they? Really? Well, they were worshiping the one true God, according to Paul. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing. So they were worshiping, even though they were doing so in an incorrect, deficient manner. Ultimately, they were, because it says, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. But goodness, St. Paul, they're, they're, you know, they're pagans. How can you tell them that ultimately they are worshiping the one true God? How is that possible? How mind-blowing is this what we are looking at here? Multiple times throughout the book of Acts, multiple times, St. Paul is directly citing multiple Greek pagans. Here in particular, there is a citation from Eratus, directly from a pagan in Acts 17, 28, where it says, we too are his offspring. Gar kai genos esmen. St. Paul, well, here, here's the incredible thing. In Acts 17, 28. Let's look at Acts 17, 28. Look at that. <clears throat> For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your poets have said. For we are also his offspring, or we too are his offspring. It's a Greek. Bears. This was said about Zeus originally. By the Pogan Eratus. Did you catch that? The, pog the pagan poet Eratus is the one that uttered these words. Originally it said about Zeus, a pagan god. Why is St. Paul doing this? St. Paul quotes a pagan and applies it to the one true God, saying we are the children of Christ, our incarnate God. The amount of criticisms that Catholics, that unfortunately are not very well informed, so they 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 don't know how to respond. Uh, the amount of criticism they take and, and then outright some deny Vatican II or, or deny this very text because they don't know how to answer it. And when I say this very text, I mean Lumen Gentium. I mean the catechism is what I mean. Uh, um, they don't know how to provide a defense they don't know about the very clear words of sacred scripture. How on earth are we going to be told that the statement from the catechism is absolutely heretical and we have an inspired author of Holy Writ, St. Paul, quoting the pagan, quoting the pagan where it is said about Zeus, something said about the true God for pagan deity, certain ones, quotes it, quotes the pagan, and applies it to our one true God, Christ, and applies it by saying, we are the children of Christ, our incarnate God. How is it that Paul, St. Paul, can do this with Greek pagan sources, but we can't do this with the Islamic ones, despite the fact that they claim to worship the God of Abraham, we recognize they don't do so properly. Nobody believes that they worship a trinity. And nobody believes the Catholic faith is apostatized and now believe that God is unipersonal. The documents clearly don't say that. And the documents clearly talk about the necessity to be united in the church, the one true church of Christ. So there is a part of this that You've got to be very happy and applaud those that desire to read these documents and dig in and, and dig deep into them. But then you must stop and wonder, why is it that other people think they are irreconcilable and they're ridiculous and they're problematic 
All the while of St. Paul is doing this, and scholars recognize it. Eretus from Phenomena. Let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of Zeus. Even the sea and the harbor are full of this god, this deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are indeed his offspring. Phenomena, one to five, from the pagan poet Eretus. What is the pagan poet Eretus doing? Pagan poet. He's talking about Zeus. Everywhere, everyone's indebted to, to Zeus. For we are indeed his offspring. Multiple scholars, but one particular one, M.J. Edwards, in quoting Eretus in Acts 17.28, from an incredible, incredible German study, notes that the Greek in Acts 17.28 is identical to Aristobulus' rendering of Eretus. The thought is still from Eretus' poem. So we could look down in the Greek where it actually says the exact thing that we've quoted multiple times. Multiple times. We too are his offspring. And, and you know, it's no, no doubt that Paul is very clearly pointing pointing out to this very fact that he is hearkening to their very sources in his evangelism to evangelize those that are worshiping the unknown God, the pagan. Uh, that, is, that is quite important. What about commentaries? What about any commentary in Acts chapter 17? What do the early church fathers have to say about this, this particular commentary? Well, we come to the golden mouth one. The one who was dubbed the golden mouth. The great uh, Saint John Chrysostomos. Ioannes ha Chrysostomos. The great early church father writing in the late 4th century. Now, this master, this great Greek author, this incredible early church father, does provide some insight into his commentary. Now, <clears throat> uh, we talked earlier about St. Justin the Martyr. There is indeed multiple incredible figures that we are going to look at. We will return. We'll do a little bit of a, a, a hop back in, in time to the great Justin the Martyr after we examine the great St. John And again, there is a lot of a lot of meat and potatoes to unpack, a ton of meat and potatoes to unpack. Impossible to really do justice in only one show. So we're going to do two of them. If you, and I've got to thank you, our, our new book coming out very soon in the papacy, a large part of you, incredible patrons and members of the channel, your incredible support has allowed us to continue doing work and allowed us to continue publishing books because your great charitable work is just, we, we are beyond, beyond grateful. So if you are a patron, you are indeed tuning into this earlier before anyone else, and you will have access to part one and two. And again, I want to recommend to the audience that series on early church fathers versus Islam, which is only available to my pa patrons. I will never air that publicly. It is a massive multi-part series on the statements of the early church fathers and medieval fathers against Islam, including a ton of translated material that doesn't exist anywhere else in English, brand new translations. That multi-part series is available only to our patrons. Please consider going over there and supporting in any way, any way you can. Your support is what keeps us running here. Paul found an altar in which the words to an unknown God were engraved. Who was that unknown God but Christ? Do you see the wisdom in changing the name? Do you see the reason he released the inscription from captivity? To save and benefit them, what else? Perhaps one might say that the Athenians wrote these words for Christ. They certainly wrote that with a different meaning. But he was nevertheless able to change it. A different meaning. What did they do then? They erected an altar. You worship on an altar. And inscribed it with the words to an unknown God 
in order to signify through the inscription, if by any chance there was another God who was still unknown to us, we will worship him too. We will worship him as well. Incredible, isn't it? That truly is incredible because what follows from him is amazing. See, they're a moderate superstition. For this reason, Paul said from the beginning, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. You not only worship the gods who are known to you, but also those who are still unknown to you. Therefore, they had written to an unknown God. The unknown God is none other than Christ. How can St. John Chrysostom say this and not be an apostate? How is that possible? How is it even remotely possible? Now, <clears throat> we will get back to talking about the Muslims, talking about Jews. Even, we'll even get back to, we'll get to examining the very words of the magnificent, incredible St. Justin the Martyr. Because the Catholic Catechism is very reminiscent of the text that we find in St. Justin the Martyr in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Incredibly reminiscent. Now, who was St. Justin the Martyr? Pagan, a convert. So this is even more amazing. Well, let's let's look at examine a little bit of who this enigmatic figure was. Of St. Justin the Martyr, we read that he was a Christian apologist born at Flavia, Neapolis, <clears throat> around 180 converted to Christianity about 130 AD, taught and defended the Christian religion in Asia Minor in Rome, where he suffered martyrdom about the year 165. Yeah, we don't know his last name. He was given uh, the name martyr, uh, just St. Justin the Martyr, because he, he was martyred, was killed. Uh, he wrote multiple apologias, um, as well as his dialogue with the Jew Trifle. Trifle the Jew, which... It's an amazing apologetic as well, apologetic work, an incredible one. And that is one of the ones that we're going to be examining today. Let's check it out. So in St. Justin the Martyr's dialogue with Trifo on this very issue, claiming that the Jews and the Christians acknowledge the same God, <laughs> he says, there will be no other God, O Trifo, nor was there from eternity any other existing but he who made and disposed all this universe nor do we think that there is one god for us another for you but that he alone is god who led your fathers out from egypt nor have we trusted in any other for there is no other but in him in whom you have also trusted the god of abraham and of isaac and of jacob what <laughs> well, how can St. Justin be sounding very much like St. Paul? And very much what is like what is echoed in the Catholic Catechism, the Catechism of the One True Church. On this very issue, claiming that the Jews and Christians acknowledge the very same God, he tells them, there's not going to be another God. There will be no other God, Trifo, nor is there any other that is eternal. But him who made, he who made and disposed all this universe. Nor do we think that there is one God for us and another for you. No, there is only one true God. And he tells him, nor have we trusted in any other. There is no other. But in him whom you have also trusted. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Now, he's not telling him, well, you worship perfectly. Otherwise, he wouldn't need to be evangelizing. Trifo the Jew and talking about the incarnation and talking about the Holy Trinity. Of course, he recognized that they were not worshiping properly, that they were incorrect in their in their faith. Otherwise, he wouldn't be evangelizing. Seriously. But he tells them: we haven't trusted in any other God. There is no other but in him whom you have also trusted in. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. 
if you've got an issue with the very clear-cut point that is being made by the catechism, hearkening to Vatican II, well, you've got a problem with Holy Writ, Holy Fathers of the Church, Doctors of the Church, and great saints of the faith. The Greek is very clear from St. Justin the Martyr. Very, very clear. You'll notice it towards the bottom. Tante on to Abraham. Right towards the bottom. The very same message echoed in Holy Writ, echoed in St. Justin the Martyr. Does he believe that Trifo was worshiping the Trinity? I think we know the answer to that, don't we? I think we very clearly know how to answer that whether he believed in the Trinity or not. Clearly didn't. He very clearly did not. And yet, St. Justin the Martyr could still say these incredibly important words. And I would hope that we ponder, ponder them for a moment. Before we move on to the next presentation, next figure. This is fun, isn't it? And we've barely begun. we barely begun. we got a lot to unpack. Again, this is barely part one. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess it's going to go to two parts. Uh, maybe it'll go to three. I'm thinking two only. For patrons, they'll be available immediately. Please consider becoming a patron. Our lowest tier is five bucks. The lowest one, and you get access to a ton of stuff. A ton of stuff. But of course, we'd recommend you look at the other tiers as well as you get incredible perks, we believe. <laughs> we believe you get great perks, including helping us pick book covers, getting your name on the inside of our books, and a lot more. Wait till you see the package we got for patrons coming up for our latest books. Anyhow, we continue. We forge forward. To John Bar Pencaye, a 7th century monk who wrote the Book of Salient Points. In this book, he says, we set out in brief a history of the events. Now let's pause there. Who is this guy setting out a history of anything? <clears throat> so we've got a great Syriac biographical dictionary. It was born in the 600s. Died in the mid eighth century. So, in hagiography, John Bar Pincaye was a monk of the convent of John Akamul, southwest of Mount Gudi. He spent time with Superior Sawisho, whom he had healed from leprosy. His text, Res Mili, treats the Muslim conquests. He's also mentioned by my friend, the great Dr. Brock, legend, many others in various different books, Ignatius Ephraim, Barsum, the great Dr. Brock, multiple different individuals. So we have here a clear individual setting points out <clears throat> as a historian would in his book of salient points. In this book, we set out in brief a history of the events which did and will occur in this temporal world, such as we have learned from the Holy Scriptures and such as our weak mind is able to comprehend. He then goes forth to point out, justice flourished in his time, and there was a great peace in the regions under his control. He allowed everyone to live as they wanted. The Muslims, in regards to the Muslims, held the worship of the one God in accordance with the customs of ancient law. Now, he a lot of what he puts forth is a criticism of Islam. He is not um, praising Islam, but he does point out to the fact that they held the worship of the one God in accordance with the customs of ancient law. Now, he doesn't then, uh, in turn, praise these customs, it, not by any means. But he's clear that when he mentions the Muslims, he notes that they held the worship of the one God in accordance with the customs of ancient law. One magnificent letter tends to get forgotten, tends to get overlooked. The great 
St. Gregory the seventh. What a magnificent letter. Now, we're going to examine this. <laughs> Notice how at times people tend to forget this clear language from him. The Pope St. Gregory the seventh <clears throat> doesn't get a whole lot of attention. But without a doubt, it's right when the Catholic Encyclopedia says that he is one of the greatest of the Roman pontiffs and one of the most memorable, remarkable men of all times. Let's read a little bit about him. He is from the 11th century, died in the 11th century as well. The early years of his life are involved in considerable obscurity. His name, Hildebrand, Hildebrand signifying to those of his contemporaries that loved him a bright flame. To those that hated him, a brand of hell would indicate some Lombard connection of his family, though at a later time. Uh, let's read a little bit more. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Let us go down and dig in more. Two of the most important transactions of his pontificate, the celebrated decree of election by which the power of choosing the Pope was vested in the College of Cardinals and the alliance but the Normans, secured by the Treaty of Maifi, were in large measure the achievement of Hildebrand, whose power and influence had now become supreme in Rome. He was an enemy, by the way, an enemy of modernism, an enemy of those that attacked the one true faith. He was a master of the faith, a great saint of the church. We go forward and reading more about him. There is so much to read, by the way. We're not going to read all of this. We're looking for things that are... Magnificent in his regard. Okay. Let's see. From the letters which Gregory addressed to his friends shortly after his election, imploring their intercession with heaven in his behalf and begging their sympathy and support, it is abundantly evident that he assumed the burden of the pontificate, which had been thrust in him only with the strongest reluctance. A lot of popes had that. And not without a great struggle of mind. To Desiderius, abbot of Monte Cassino, speaks of his elevation in terms of terror giving utterance to the words of the psalmist, I am coming to the deep waters so that the floods run over me. Fearlessness and trembling are come upon me, and darkness hath covered me. And in view of the appalling nature of the task that lay before him, of its difficulties, no one indeed had a clearer perception than he. It cannot appear strange that he, even his intrepid spirit was for the moment overwhelmed. For at the time of Gregory's elevation to the papacy, the Christian world was in a deplorable condition. During the desolating era of transition, that terrible period of warfare and rapine, violence and corruption in high places, which followed immediately upon the dissolution of the, of the Car Car Carlovingian Empire, a period when society in Europe and all existing institutions seemed doomed to utter destruction and ruin, the church had not been able to escape from the general debasement. There is so much to read, and he, he ends up being, by the way, one of the most magnificent popes, a great papacy, a great pontificate that he has, uh, very memorable. Um, with admirable, discer admirable discernment, Gregory began his great work of purifying the church by a reformation of the clergy. At his first Lenten Synod in March, 1074, he enacted multiple magnificent decrees, great decrees, great early pope, <clears throat> and a pope that we're examining right now, a pope who notes that almighty God, who wishes that all should be saved and none lost, wishes, approves nothing in so much as that after loving him, one should love his fellow men. And that one should not do to others what one does not want done to oneself. Clearly, the golden rule. You can find this in the Deuterocanonical text as well. You and we owe this charity to yourselves, to ourselves. Especially because we believe in and confess one God. Now, of course, here he is talking about Muslims. Muslims here. Look at his language. You and we owe this charity to ourselves, especially because we believe in and confess one God, admittedly, in a different way, and daily praise and venerate him, the creator of the world and ruler of this world. Did you catch that, though? We believe in and confess one God, admittedly, in a different way. 
the very same language of sacred scripture, the very same language we find in the great Saint Justin the Martyr is echoed in Pope Saint Gregory the Seventh's letter three. The very same one that you can find in the Patrologia Latina. The very same one in the Patrologia Latina. You and we owe this charity to ourselves, especially because we believe in and confess one God, admittedly, in a different way. This is the message that we have been attempting to hammer home all along. We have been emphasizing all along. So, again, again, we're going to return to the, the exact language here of, of uh, the catechism. And then we're going to go back here. Repetition helps. Learn things. But this is incredible. None of these magnificent saints would argue that the Catholic faith was not the true faith. You have to be Catholic. Catholicism was the fullness. This is the very same message of the catechism. Evangelization is still necessary. Of course. Are you telling me that we're told to not evangelize in the catechism because of the statements on Islam and on the Jews? Really? That's why in the very same context it says some lack the gospel. Some are not linked to the church. And you must be part of the church. It says, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, if they refused to enter or remain could not be saved. Everything must be interpreted in context. But it's not being interpreted in context. When people come out and they laugh and they mock and they say, well, look at your Pope. Look at the catechism. We do not worship the one true God. With them, they don't worship the same God. Now, the one thing that we uh, have emphasized over and over, we don't believe they're, that, that metaphysically they're the same God. That would be outrageous, ludicrous. Historically the same God, yes. Metaphysically, no. Nobody would ever argue otherwise. But this is exactly why St. Paul is able to cite multiple Greek pagans to hammer home the exact Greek of Eretus, where it reads, we too are his offspring. The exact Greek, which was said about Zeus, why did Paul do it and apply it to the one true God? And why is the very same ideology present here where it says, we confess one God? Why wouldn't Paul just come out and say, hey, this is not the same God. This is a different God. No, Paul quotes a pagan. And then he applies it to the one true God, saying we are children of Christ. Our incarnate God. Paul did this with the Greek sources. Does he then tell them to remain in their erroneous worship? Of course not. He evangelizes, which is what we should do, which is what the catechisms, the very hearkening to what the catechism hearkens to, the very documents in Vatican II tell us, Sarah, that one must be part of the true church. It doesn't then say God is you and I personal. Let's get real for a moment. Let's not play these uh, comedy capers games here. But we, we run into them all the time. From our evangelical friends who don't even know the historical context of, the, of what the catechism is hearkening to. Or our Eastern friends who don't, don't understand it. I mean, the amount of Eastern brothers and sisters of ours that reject that without even knowing the context, is appalling. And they will then claim, well, this is proof of the apostasy of Rome. Really? I mean, there's so many patriarchs, you can lose count of the ones that made appalling statements in favor of Islam. Appalling statements. And would we then point to those and say that their faith system has crumbled and fallen apart? It's laughable. La absolutely laughable. Stick to the arguments. By the way, we're going to have fun dealing with some of their own things, some of their own magnificent saints. We're not even done. This is barely part one. 
The juices are barely flowing. Barely flowing. Well, this is fun, isn't it? I'm, I'm having a blast, and I'm barely beginning. I don't even know how, how long have we gone. We've gone over half an hour, and I'm barely beginning. We're barely beginning this incredible study. This sacred council wishes to turn its attention firstly to the Catholic faithful, basing itself upon sacred scripture and tradition. It teaches that the church now sojourning on earth as an exile is necessary for salvation. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter it or remain in it, could not be saved. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator, but never does it say that their worship is acceptable. It does not say that they worship in a correct fashion. It says they profess. They adore the one merciful God. They do not do so properly. They do not worship God in a trinity. They believe God is unite person. We've said it over and over. But everything noted in Lumen Gentium, everything that the catechism is hearkening to, is very clear. Lumen Gentium is showing us the Protestants, our Eastern friends, Eastern Christians, I'm using those as examples, for instance, uh, where it says the church recognizes in many ways those linked with us, baptized and honored with the name of Christian. For example, I'm telling you evangelicals and then those that uh, who do not preserve unity of communion with the successor of Peter, I'm giving an example, our Orthodox friends. They do not profess the fullness of truth. Or as the very text in Lumen Gentium says, the faith in its entirety. Yes, we need to evangelize. We've got to. In all of Christ's disciples, the Spirit arouses the desire to be peacefully united in the manner determined by Christ. How is that manner? As one flock under one shepherd, and he prompts them to pursue this end. But what is the catechism hearkening to? Vatican II. And Vatican II says... Finally, those who have not yet received the gospel are related in various ways to the people of God. Is it talking about those that have gotten the gospel, that have heard the gospel, and rejected it, and willfully said, I reject this Catholic faith? No, it is not. It is not talking about those in invincible uh, ignorance when it says, when it says, excuse me, let me, let me correct myself. When it says those who have not yet received the gospel, those that do, that are invincibly ignorant, would fall under this banner. I meant to say that those that have received the gospel, know the gospel, and willfully reject it, do not fall under that banner. Because it tells you right there. It's right there. And as I brought up the Jewish people, the section that speaks to the Jewish people in the first place, or in this very language of the text, as related in various ways to the people of God, the language is incredibly reminiscent of the text in St. Justin the Martyr in his dialogue with Trifo. Rewind and go back and hear it. Rewind and go back and hear it. There's really nothing else I can tell you. There's really not much, not much else that can be done in examining that. But... Let us continue. Interesting enough, we also find, uh, well, we find multiple figures that confirm the thesis that we've been putting forth today. Of course, the one thing that I, we need to really emphasize is that <laughs> nowhere are we treating Islam as an acceptable religion. Um, nowhere are we treating Islam as a... Uh, or the Muslims, as people that don't need evangelization. I think Vatican II is very clear that they do need evangelization, very desperately as well, because they are in great peril by sticking to their horrifically erroneous, terribly erroneous holy book. And their denial of Christ as eternal God, their denial of the true faith is, is very problematic. But we find uh, this to be consistent. You find in the Middle Ages, early, this early Middle Ages, of course, 
You find it in Sabaeus, who is writing in the seventh century. A number of times he calls them Ishmaelites. And he notes that, despite disagreeing with them, of course, he notes that Muhammad himself preaches and that they make the claim that with an oath, God promised that land to Abraham and his posterity after him forever. Now you, you are the sons of Abraham, and God will realize in you the promise made to Abraham and his posterity. Only love the God of Abraham and go and take possession of your country, which God gave to your father Abraham. And none will be able to resist you in battle, for God is with you. Presents them as a military, uh, military kind of force, as a number of medieval uh, figures did. But uh, what is important is that they don't paint Islam in a positive light at all. But they do note how Muslims made these certain claims. And by the way, nobody, there's not a single serious uh, uh, Christian historian that would believe that Muhammad uh, was saying the truth. Or that, uh, or that he actually came from the from the stock of um, of the true people of God. It's ridiculous. It's uh, patently absurd. But the claims are being made here. They are claiming to worship the God of Abraham. Are they doing so in an orthodox manner? They're, they are not doing so in an orthodox manner. There, there's no doubt. I mean, there's there's so much more that can be looked at. There's uh, Nicodemus Coniatis from the twelfth. Uh, I believe actually from the late 12th, 13th century, um, we have multiple other, multiple figures throughout this time period that um, will point to the fact that they believe they were part of an Abrahamic religion, that they believe that they were worshiping properly, but they, of course, were not worshiping in an orthodox manner. They were not worshiping properly. Even St. John Damascus believed that <clears throat> Islam was a Christological heresy. And it's understandable that he believed that. Uh, it's very understandable that he believed it was a Christological heresy because of the very clear teachings that were robbed from various Christian groups of the region, the ignorance of the Christian faith, but the attempt to rob uh, from the Bible, clearly done by Muhammad, but done so in an almost ridiculous kind of fashion, very clearly indicative of the silliness um, that can be found in the Quran. And among among uh, it, even the, the attempt to reconcile such by Islamic scholars is, is downright uh, unfortunately not possible, and it it makes uh, it doesn't make any sense. So we've looked at a number of figures today. We promised you the audience that we have much more, and we do have much more now. Where do we go in our next examinations? Now again, remember the theme. This is an important theme. The theme is, number one, uh, the claims that are being made by the Catholic Catechism. Are they reconcilable with Scripture, with early church history? Uh, are there, is there precedence to make such claims by showing uh, other groups of religions that claimed to worship uh, and that Christian individuals, indeed great saints and biblical authors, would in turn note that these people were worshiping erroneously but indeed uh turn this around for evangelization to show that even though they are worshiping in an erroneous fashion uh it, what it, it amounts to them worshiping the one true god although doing so in an improper manner and needing to be evangelized and needing to be shown uh to be directed and steered in the right way again we show that no matter what historically Yes, worship of the one true God. Yes, the worship of one God. Metaphysically, no. We would disagree there. Uh, we would have to hammer that home there. But uh, again, perhaps our greatest example, our greatest example, we're going to pop that up right now. Our greatest example has got to be St. Paul, who... And I want to be very careful with the language here because he's talking to them here and he's he's noticing that they're worshiping. They've got an altar. They are giving la trevo, la tria, and they're doing so to an unknown God. Now, when Paul stumbles upon this, when he stands in the midst of the Areopagus, what he does is he begins to cite multiple Greek pagans. And he says... The one that you're worshiping, without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, 
since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temple, temples made with hands. Now, they're worshiping an unknown God. Are they worshiping Christ as incarnate God? Or Christ as the second person of the Trinity? Now, if you answer in the affirmative that they are doing that knowingly, <laughs> well, it would be ridiculous because he, he tells them right there that they, they're pagans. And he's telling them right there, the one that you worship without knowing. In other words, they are ignorant. Him I proclaim to you. So Paul can cite multiple Greek poets and then can go to the text that says, we too are his offspring in verse 28, which is said about Zeus. He can apply a text that is directed to a pagan god, to Zeus, and he can apply that to Christ. Because clearly this was said about Zeus. We too are his Offspring. Eretus was referring to Zeus. Paul quotes it and applies it to the one true God. Christ is the one true God according to the Bible. And he does it by noting that we are children of Christ, our incarnate God. Now, they were not heading to Mass. They were not partaking of the Eucharist. They were not uh, knowingly uh, worshiping Christ. Uh, but it's very clear what is being put forth here. Paul is utilizing Greek sources, and he's doing that very clearly, noting that they are worshiping an unknown God. And he's very clear that there is only one God. This is a very clear, clear point put forth by Saint Justin the Martyr. Again, this is the original text. Paul quotes that, applies that to Christ, the one true God. The Greek in Acts 17.28 is identical. It is from Eretus. The thought is from his poem. The very same is in St. Justin the Martyr. There is no other God. So you can say until you're blue in the face, well, they're not worshiping properly. They're not worshiping God in the Trinity. We recognize that. We know that. But as St. Justin the Martyr says, there is no other God. Oh, Trifo. He knew Trifo didn't believe in the Incarnation. He knew Trifo didn't believe God was a Trinity. Nor was there from eternity any other existing. But he who made and disposed all the universe. Nor do we think that there is one God for us and another for you. No, there are not multiple one true gods. But that he alone is God who let your, led your fathers out from Egypt. Nor have we trusted in any other for there is no other. But in him whom you have also trusted the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob. And then he then evangelizes. This is the message of Vatican II. This is the message of Lumen Gentium. This is the message that is being hearkened to. That is why you must realize the context of what the catechism is saying. Metaphysically, no. Historically, yes. This must be very clear. If you are to understand the text in the catechism of the Catholic Church. Are we done? We're barely beginning. Because in part two, we will examine the language of St. Gregory of Palamas. We will examine the language of the great Pope Pius. We will ex examine multiple other figures. Are we done? We're barely beginning.